Hello everyone, it's Mello. If you've been on this channel before, you know this video. You know this video has been in the works. <laughs> also, I'm in a completely new... <laughs> I'm on dog duty right now. Um... <laughs> if you hear them throughout the video, I am so sorry. They have really bad separation anxiety. So I'm hanging out. Anyway, as I said, if you know me, you knew that this video was a long time coming. If you don't know me, then hi, I'm Mello. Uh, a Girl in Poe is my favorite author of all time. If you go on my channel, I actually have a playlist dedicated to a mini series that I did talking about Poe. The first episode is about his life, the second episode is about his poems, and the third is about his short stories. In that last video, I did leave out a decent amount. I only talked about three of his short stories, and I mentioned that I wanted to continue to make videos about the rest of his short stories. One being The Fall of the House of Usher. It is one of my favorites. I love it. So when I found out that Netflix was coming out with a mini series about The Fall of the House of Usher, done. I knew I was making a video. <laughs> I've been kind of going through it the last few weeks, planning out how I wanted to do it. Um, originally, I was going to make this another two-part series where this week we would talk about the short story, follow up next week, and talk about the series but I didn't want to do that <laughs> so instead for me it's a two-part series but for you everything will be nicely put together in this one video today is currently October 6th um, so I'm going to walk you through the short story itself we're gonna do a very typical mellow video where I'm going to give you a plot summary we're gonna talk about some literary choices some themes symbols um, the meaning of the story what makes the story the story. And then the series will come out on Thursday for me. I'm gonna binge watch it. Uh, I'll give you some live reactions of the series. And then at the end of this video, I will include a little review on the series. If you are here simply because you just wanna know about the series, you just wanna see my reactions about the series itself and you wanna skip the part with the short story, I'll leave time stamps in the description below so you can just skip right to that part. I definitely suggest staying around and learning about the short story. Um, it's amazing. I'll also put a link in the description to like a PDF version of the story. Throughout this video, I'm going to mention a lot of different parts and elements of um, the story without reading direct quotes. So if you want to open it up and see it as I'm talking about it, go for it. Or if you just want to read it on your own, go for it. Again, I highly suggest that you do stick around for this part about the short story. I suggest that you read it on your own before you watch the series, but if you're not going to, you're not going to, so it's okay. <laughs> also, don't worry, I rushed into this video because I'm so excited. I do have my Bev, so don't worry. Anyways, let's get started. We're going to talk about the short story first. As I said, um, I'm going to kind of go through it as briefly as I can with still touching on everything that I want to touch on, and then we'll come back to the series. Already plot-wise, I can tell that the short story and the series are going to be wildly different. The Fall of the House of Usher, the short story, um, follows the narrator on his way to visit his childhood best friend, Roderick Usher, because Roderick is very sick, and the short story is about his illness and the fall of the House of Usher. The series, from my understanding so far, eliminates the narrator character. It's about, like, Roderick Usher. I think he's, like, the father of this family and he's watching like all of his kids die or it's something like that. I can already tell plot wise, nothing is the same. If you watched my video last week about the haunting of Hill House, that is another thing that I mentioned. The Hill House story in the book is wildly different from the one in the movie. So this is definitely a common theme with the series. That being said, um, before we dive in to the elements of the short story itself, it is important to start with analyzing what the title even means in the first place. Every single word in the title was very strategically planned. Fall can be attributed to many different meanings, whether that be like a biblical reference, you know, like sin, fall, <laughs> whether that be like a physical tumbling, whether that be the season, autumn, all of these things are true. It is a double meaning in the sense that every single one of those are correct. The story does take place in the autumn. The house, as we will see, will physically fall and there's definitely some elements of sin going on. And there's a lot of imagery about heaven and hell throughout the story. Same with the house of Usher itself. That in itself is a double meaning. You read that for the first time and you're gonna think of the physical house of Usher. 
but it's going to be revealed to us throughout the story that the house of usher like the physical house and the family are so tied together that people regard the family as the house of usher so not only is the physical house you know physically falling or biblically falling the family itself also is Analyzing the title sets a very good tone for all of Poe's works in general because you can tell how strategically he plans every single word that he uses. Every single word that goes into every single one of his works was strategically planned. The story also begins with an epigraph, so we're not even at the first line yet. It translates to, his slash her heart is a poisoned lute. As soon as it is touched, it resounds. Uh, going through that as fast as I possibly can, my interpretation is that that quote comes from the narrator himself. Um, the word used in French to mean his slash her is gender ambiguous, so it's ambiguous as to who it's um, talking about. Roderick, we're gonna learn, has a sister, so it could be talking about Roderick, but it could be talking about his sister. Or, this is something that we'll talk about towards the end of the analyzing, but they are siblings, they're twins, and so it could be referencing both of them at the same time. All right, now we're gonna get to the opening line. I'm gonna read it to you from my book. Little side story. I bought this book, it is a thrifted book. I have two versions of it. I have one that is 50 years old. I think this one's probably like 10 or 15, um, but this is my, my annotated version. So my little October project is going through and annotating everything. I've been having so much fun. Thank you for asking. Anyways, this opening line is a very long one. So buckle in. During the whole of a dull, dark, and soundless day in the autumn of the year, when the clouds hung oppressively low in the heavens, I had been passing alone on horseback through a singularly dreary tract of country and at length found myself as the shades of the evening drew on within view of the melancholy house of usher that is a huge sentence that is a very long sentence poe uses them throughout the duration of this entire story to set the tune the mood the setting of the house as an opening line i don't really think it's the strongest it doesn't really draw me in as much as some other ones like the casco amontillado is the one that i think of for one of his best opening lines. That one drew me in immediately. So this one isn't his best opening line, but for the story, it's good. It's dark, stormy, it's gloomy. It immediately is painting the house as this like terrible thing. We see the word oppressive used for the first time here. It is a word and it is a theme that we will see throughout the entire story. I'm not going to point out every time Poe uses the word oppressive, but just know he uses it a lot. Imprisonment, claustrophobia, like seclusion, forced isolation, those are all things that are very prevalent throughout the whole story. Anyways, a lot of talking. Plot-wise, what is going on? Our narrator is on his way to the house of Usher to meet with his childhood friend, Roderick Usher, at his home, the house of Usher. <laughs> very gloomy, it's very dark, it is secluded, it is in his own section, it's like surrounded by this tarn, which is like a mountain lake. It's very prison-like, it's very claustrophobic. It has very weird vibes inside and out. Again, if you're not gonna read the story, that's totally okay, but I definitely do suggest just skimming through it and looking at all the imagery because it is so beautiful. This is a huge thing that I'm worried about when it comes to the series because if they don't nail the setting perfectly, I'm gonna be mad. <laughs> we immediately establish that the house has eye-like windows. This insinuates that either the house is alive in some kind of way or it is symbolically watching over its residents. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, the House of Usher is also in regards to the family line itself. So maybe that is symbolic of the family watching over the generations after them. Back to Roderick though, why is the narrator here? They were childhood besties, but many years went on, they hadn't really talked to each other. And so one day the narrator gets a letter sent from Roderick saying that he's very ill, uh, both mentally and emotionally, and he would love to have the comfort of his childhood friend. Come stay at his house, the house of Usher. <laughs> the narrator immediately establishes that he doesn't really know that much about Roderick. They were good friends growing up, but he doesn't really know that much about him. It adds on to the mystery of what is going on. Regardless though, we do learn a little bit about Roderick and his family right now. Family line, the ushers, they were never really doing that well. Typically only one member of the family like lived on through the generation, you know? Meaning what they what they were what they what they did. Incest. This is a very incestual family line. Their bloodline is completely pure because they only breed 
with each other. <laughs> Immediately your first thought should be, well, he's sick. Does it have to do with the incest? Here we establish for the first time that the House of Usher is not only about the physical house, but the family line itself. It is so commonly used to talk about the family because they never leave the house. The house is where they live for their entire life. Everything that they need is in the house. Their doctors, their food, blah, blah, blah. All of it is in the house. They very rarely, if ever, leave the house. So the narrator arrives. It's very claustrophobic inside. It's very isolating. It's very creepy and eerie but he gets inside and he makes his way to Roderick's room. Roderick is very clearly sick. He is not doing well. He describes his symptoms as, um, and paraphrasing, morbid acuteness of the senses, food was endurable, textures of like shirts and stuff on his skin were did not feel good. The smell of flowers was oppressive. Um, his eyes were super sensitive to light and music hurt his ears. Roderick is immediately very scared of the house. He insinuates starting right away that the house is alive, the house is a curse, and that's why he is sick. We also learn now that Roderick has a sister, Madeline. She's also very sick, but she is sick in a very different way. It seems as though she is cataleptic, so she doesn't really have control of her limbs. The sickness has gone on too long, so the doctors can't really do anything. They can't really help her. It's gone on too long. And again, Roderick blames the house for both of their illnesses. The narrator does exactly what he thinks he is there to do, to cheer up Roderick, to listen to his music, to read his writing, to help him cheer him up. But nothing really helps because Roderick is so convinced that the house is unhealthy, that he is dying because of the house. We read this poem. I believe that Roderick wrote it. It's pretty long, but the narrator finds it and he reads it. It's called The Haunted Palace. I have in my script that it's called The Haunted Place, but I'm almost positive it's called The Haunted Palace. Yeah, I was right. It's called The Haunted Palace. <laughs> Again, I'm not gonna read it for you here word for word. If you wanna go open up that PDF and skim through it, you'll be able to find it pretty easily. I suggest you do so. What the poem is there to do is to symbolize and foreshadow our House of Usher. The story begins with this palace. It paints it as beautiful, radiant, angelic. It's radiating, it's beautiful, expensive, luxurious angelic kind of thing. But then halfway through the poem, there is a switch. It becomes evil. Everywhere around it, nature is dying and dead. Everything around it is dead. It is a bad place. The poem ends with the line, a hideous song, rush out forever and laugh, but smile no more. I love that line. Laugh, but smile no more is so perfect. The poem is in place to symbolize and parallel our own house and the family line itself. It started as this beautiful thing, but now we're watching it slowly turn evil. A thing that is going to continue to happen in this story is that Poe is going to continue to reference stories, poems, stuff like that, but the catch is they're not real. None of them are real. Poe made them up. It's why I love the epigraph at the beginning so much because that is a real quote by a real life person. But the lines of reality are so blurred in this story and we're gonna talk about it later. But the whole point of referencing that these like fake stories is because the lines of reality are completely blurred. So including an epigraph from a real person confuses the lines even more. <laughs> That's why I take it as it is supposed to be a quote from the narrator himself. After a few days of our narrator being there, Roderick tells our narrator that unfortunately his sister Madeline has passed away. He wants to bury her body down below in the family tomb before the funeral because um, her sickness was so unique that he doesn't want her body to be taken advantage of in death. So he asks for help to go bury Madeline. So they begin, they start burying her. The narrator points out that her cheeks, they're very rosy. She has a lingering smile on her face. And immediately you're like, yeah! It is here that we find out for the first time that Roderick and Madeline are not siblings. Well, they are siblings, but they're not just siblings. They are twins. They are one and the same. A few more days go by and Roderick by the date is growing more and more anxious. He's getting very weird. He's very obviously creeped out. His sickness is deteriorating him. Like he's obviously going through it. So one night there is a huge storm. There's this gas-like aura, my asthma surrounding the house and neither men can sleep. Roderick is absolutely hysterical. The narrator now and many times throughout the story is a very scientific guy and he's trying to 
scientifically prove everything. So they see the gas and he's like, oh man, don't worry, that's completely normal. It's not even that uncommon, it's fine. <laughs> so as I said, Roderick is absolutely hysterical. So the narrator is like, look, I just picked up your favorite book. Look, I have your favorite book. I'm gonna read you your favorite book. Come sit down, I'm gonna read you your favorite book. But the twist is it is not his favorite book. It is just the first one <laughs> that he picked up. And again, this is not a real piece of literature. Poe made it up. He made up the story, he made up the author. So he begins reading and he gets to the point in the story, I believe a dragon cries out, yells out. And as he reads that, a sound in real life mirrors that sound. The narrator is like, yeah, whatever. It's just my imagination, it's fine. But this happens two more times. <laughs> it crosses and it blurs the lines between reality and fiction. The story crosses that literary boundary. Roderick is completely disassociated. He's losing it. He is, you know, rocking back and forth and swaying. He's handling his fear in a very childlike way. Roderick then breaks down. He reveals that they buried Madeline alive and he's been hearing the sounds of her trying to claw out of the coffin all week. I'm gonna read it to you because um, it's creepy. Roderick says, oh, pity me, miserable wretch that I am. I dared not, I dared not speak. We have put her living in the tomb. Said I not that my senses were acute? I now tell you that I heard her first feeble movements in the hollow coffin. I heard them many, many days ago. Yet I dared not, I dared not speak. And now tonight, Ether, Etherled, Etherled? That's one of the characters in their fake story. <laughs> the breaking of the hermit's door and the death cry of the dragon and the clangor of the shield. Say rather the rending of her coffin and the grating of the iron hinges of her prison and her struggles within the coppered archway of the vault. Oh, whither shall I fly? Will she not be here anon? Is she hurrying to upbraid me for my haste? Have I not heard her footsteps on the stair? Do I not distinguish that heavy and horrible beating of her heart? madman. Here he sprung furiously to his feet and shrieked out his syllables as if in an effort he were giving up his soul. Madman, I tell you that she now stands without the door. So he's obviously losing it. Um, I'm gonna put the quote on screen somewhere so you can see the literary choices that Poe used, but the use of the dashes, the italicizing, all of it is very important. I think literary, that was a beautiful quote i loved the literary choices that poe used but again it crosses the lines between what's real and what's fake because roderick is referencing things that happen in the story but what he is meaning are the real events that are going on madeline does exactly that she breaks down the door and in standing there she's in a white gown it has blood all over she attacks roderick sinking him down to the ground taking his soul down the narrator runs out he flees He's running from the house and as he looks behind him as he's running away, he sees the house fall to the ground. So what does any of that mean? As I said, the Netflix series is going to take a different plot. The plot of the series and the short story are going to be completely different. Um, I'm kind of butthurt about it. I think I'm definitely going to be going in with a little bit of a bias. Um, regardless, I think I'm gonna be a little bit upset that the series is completely different. Um, all I can say is that I hope the setting that they nail um, the themes, the symbols, the double meaning of everything, that is a huge one. If they use and they implement all of that, then I think I'll be okay. <laughs> but, but I'm already knocking down some points because they're getting rid of my plot. However, the first thing I want to talk about when we analyze what any of that means is what we started out with talking with, and that is double meanings. Because I'm not sure if you caught on to it, but there is another double meaning in the name, the fall of the House of Usher. Usher itself was a symbolically, strategically planned name. The story ends with the narrator says he's rushing out of the house. <laughs> the name is symbolic of the act of crossing. It happens many different times, the act of crossing over. Into the house for the first time, Usher's letter to the narrator ushers him to cross the line between like reality and the House of Usher to cross that line to come visit him. And because he crossed that line, that might just be the catalyst for the fall itself. I'm not sure if you picked up on it, but the first thing that I questioned and was confused about is why the narrator is there if Usher is so afraid of the outside world. We established that the Usher family is fearful of the outside world and that they stay in their house and they have everything that they need in the house and they don't leave. So why is the narrator there? Why is Roderick comfortable with the narrator? And I think that's the whole point. 
The narrator is the catalyst for the fall because he crossed over the Usher line. The act of crossing is also prevalent in both fictional stories talked about. The haunting palace, the poem, and the mad trice at the end. Um, that's the story that they're reading for clarification. Both things cross that literary line between what's real and what's fake. And I absolutely loved that aspect of the story because Poe, um, as we know, through his time um, like working at magazines and stuff, he was absolutely obsessed with like puzzles, word games, codes, like code names and stuff like that. Like, he loved like the puzzle. So the theme of like double meanings is very important to this story. The house itself, when we see it for the first time, it's not the narrator looking at the house. He looks in to the reflection on the lake. And when he sees the house for the first time, he's looking at its reflection looking at it's a double. There's a whole meaning there with him looking at the house upside down and that referencing and being symbolic of Madeline and Roderick, but because Madeline and Roderick, they're not just siblings, they're twins, but they're double of the same. This is a thing that I hope is used max, to its max potential in the series, because if they don't nail that double meaning and if they don't cross that line between what's real and what's fake, it's a no from me. <laughs> No, this story has a lot of different interpretations and like meanings for what it's supposed to mean. It is a commentary on watching a family line die out because of evil things like incest, the collapse of just rich families too. But because of how much the fictional world, like that line is blurred, it makes what the meaning of this story is very murky water. The two main things that I see when uh, people talk about this story are number one, the house is representative of the mind's fragile state, the mind's fragile, you know, being. It is a take on the destruction of the human body, which can also be true in the other interpretation. And that is that Roderick and Madeline have an incestual relationship and that's why the house falls. Sin. I don't know how I feel about this story. It's one of my favorites because it's one of the only things by Poe that I just appreciate as a story. Like a telltale heart, of course. I love the story. I love, you know, like the heart beating under the floorboards, the cask of Montiato. I love the story of, you know, Montresor luring Fortunato through the um, catacombs. But when I think of those stories, I think about the underlying deeper meaning within them. When I think about the fall of the House of Usher, I just think about the story. I don't think about our deeper meaning. Like it has a meaning, just not in the same way. And I think a lot of people might disagree with me when I say that, which is totally okay. Literature is one of my favorite things because it is similar to any art related things. It's very subjective. The meaning that you're gonna find in it is very personal. So personally for me, I don't really think about a deeper meaning when I think about this story. I think of a family line dying out, but I don't think of this like deep meaning. <laughs> I also think that this story is really interesting because at its core, it is about an ancestral family line dying out. If you know anything about Poe, he married his cousin. <laughs> the story was released, I think three years after they got married. I think they got married in 1936. Like, and this story was in 1939. My memory might be wrong. I'll confirm it in editing. So they were already good and well married at this time. And I think it's really important for people to read because um, as far as my reading goes about Bo and Virginia, like obviously it's gross. He never really had like a sexual relationship with Virginia as it seems. I don't know if it's confirmed, but from my reading, they slept in different rooms. <laughs> like everyone that knew Bo and Virginia knew that they were just like happy people. They were just chilling. They weren't really like intimate or anything like that. Cause she was also very young. They were always just like frolicking through fields and like doing music together and stuff like that. Like they were just butts. Poe at his core married Virginia because one, abandonment issues go crazy, and two, because he was saving her from other weird men who were bad people. So I think this is a very interesting story in Poe's life specifically, because it definitely shows that he did have a little bit, he had a little, he had, a li he had, he had some morals. You know, like cousins, they're okay. Siblings, your twin, bad. Your family line will die. <laughs> Don't take that the wrong way. I think marrying your cousin is very gross. I think that was a very gross thing that Poe did, but anyways, that's the story. That's the short story. I'm kind of upset um, because I can't watch the series for a few more days. You get to watch it with me in like a few seconds, but the series itself is already taking a twist on the plot. So if they don't nail the setting and the like mystery and all of those elements, and they don't implement like the grammatical choices that Poe uses, 
can definitely be translated to film and if they don't do that well again it's gonna be a no from me i'm trying to go into this with an open mind i do know myself very well and i'm very I'm very picky when it comes to Poe related stuff. I know that I criticize anything relating Poe very heavily, um, like people making interpretations and stuff of it. I interpret it very, very critically. I'm very critical in my critiques when it comes to Poe because I'm a little bit of a perfectionist because I love him so much. So I'm gonna try and go into it with as much of an open mind as I can in the trailer that they were really emphasizing the word nevermore. So I'm assuming that in the series, they're gonna be making a lot of Poe references in his other works, um, which we'll see. I feel like that can either be really bad or really good. Book his book up. Yeah! He's still tired. <laughs> Anyways, I'm gonna go. Present day Nello is gonna go. Um, in a few seconds, you'll see me in a few days watching the series i'm gonna give you some live reactions and then i'm gonna give you a little review i'm not gonna do the very mellow typical video where i do like a you know episode by episode summary of what's going on um, i'm gonna try and spoil it as little as possible too so that you can still go and watch it on your own this is uh, solely just gonna be like a review and more so me talking about like as a poe fan does this hold up so i'll see you then <laughs> All right, everyone, welcome back. <laughs> Apologies for welcoming myself back. I know it's been a matter of seconds for you. For me, it's been about a week. I filmed that last section on October 6th, I think I said. Today is, oh, Friday the 13th. What better day to be filming a spooky video? And obviously the Netflix series came out yesterday. I spent all day watching it yesterday so that we could talk about it today. I'm not gonna lie to you guys. I'm gonna get it out of the way now. I'm disappointed. I am very conflicted when talking about this series, but the main feeling I feel is disappointment. However, let's backtrack. I have a few things to say before we get into really talking about the review. Number one, remember something I said a few minutes ago. I was talking about how books meaning all of that is very subjective. And of course that applies for film as well. If you disagree with any way that I feel in this video, if you don't have the same opinions I do, if this was your favorite series of all time, good for you. That's totally okay. Art, film, whatever it may be, it's very subjective. If you enjoy it, but I don't, if you find meaning in it, but I don't, that's totally okay. That is the purpose for art, right? Just remember, just remember that it's okay to disagree. <laughs> Number two, I didn't script this. <laughs> Typically all my videos, I pretty much word for word script what I'm gonna say and I didn't for this. As I said, I finished the series yesterday. I wanted to just get this filmed, edited, posted as quickly as I could, um, get it out there for you guys. So I didn't script this because if I did, it would have been another day of scripting and then I would have had to film and then edit and it would have just been a mess. So I have a few talking points that I know I want to hit, but it's not scripted. Apologies ahead of time if anything I say is jambled. This is very much just gonna be a conversation between two besties, not so much like a clean and concise, like scripted out video essay. It's gonna be me and you having a conversation, but it's one-sided because I don't, I cannot hear you. <laughs> Please don't try to talk to me. I guarantee you, I, I can't hear it. I can't hear it. <laughs> the last thing I wanna say is that this is going to be a spoiler-free conversation with you. I'm going to stay away from talking about any of like the messages, the themes, the overlying, reason that everyone is dying. I'm gonna stay away from talking about any of those major things. If I do talk about them towards the end of the video, I will give another spoiler warning, so don't worry there. So you know, if you haven't watched the series yet and you still wanna watch this video, you are totally good to do so. I won't spoil anything major here, so you can still go off and watch the series and really enjoy it. That being said, I have my Poe mug here, but it's, I hold my mugs with this hand, so it just looks like a white mug usually, but Nevermore. Also, I'm a freak of nature and I can't drink anything without a straw. <laughs> Anyways, let's talk. I'm disappointed. I'm really disappointed and I'm really conflicted, but I'm mainly disappointed. <laughs> I have boiled down the series into two sections and we're going to talk heavily about both. There is section one, which is episodes one through four, and then there's section two, which is episodes five through eight. Section one sucks. It's really bad. The spooks suck. The setting is terrible. The dialogue, it's cringy, it's easy, it's cheap. Whoever was the screenwriter for all of that, <laughs> kidding. 
but the dialogue itself was cringy, it was cheap, it was easy, there was so much unnecessary cussing, which if you know me, that is my biggest grime with every like book, any, any media relating thing. If you use cuss words in order to get your point across. So yeah, section one was just bad. Section two, I thought was actually really good. I think the spooks still weren't Mike Flanagan's greatest, but the spooks that I did enjoy did come from section two. I think they nailed the gothic setting way more. I think the Poe adaptations got way more faithful and they made sense and I liked them. Same with the Poe references too, I, I liked them. There was still a lot about section two that I didn't really enjoy, but the things that I did enjoy came from section two. However, because section one was so f***ing terrible, <laughs> Section 2 is not really that enjoyable for me. If I have to get through four hours of pop culture references, really bright settings, cringy dialogue, the spooks being not good, unfaithful in Poe adaptations that I dislike, if I have to get through four hours of that just to get, you know, a better series, Section 1 feels so rushed and feels so pushy of trying to get a certain audience, it just feels so soulless. It doesn't feel like there is any heart that went into the first section, but then the second section feels like love. Like I can feel Mike Flanagan's like his own work. It really shines. Like the second section really goes together with his other work. I don't know what section one is. <laughs> Let's take a step back. What's going on? <laughs> As I said earlier, uh, the Fall of the House of Usher follows Roderick. He is the head of the family because he is the CEO of this pharmaceutical company named Fortunato. I will say I did really enjoy Fortunato being the name of the pharmaceutical company. I think it makes sense. Um, the ending of that was really good. I do think using Fortunato as the name for the company was a good move. But yeah, and the series is about um, everyone dying. <laughs> All of his kids die off one by one by one by one. And it's about Roderick and Madeline coming to terms with shady shit that they did. So that's what the series is. It takes a very similar approach to Hill House where every sibling gets their own episode, but every episode is like titled based off of a Poe short story and then the sibling dies in the same manner. So the second episode, <laughs> second episode is The Mask of the Red Death and it shows the sibling having a masquerade ball and then dying <laughs> and so on and so forth. It happens all the way up until that last episode, which I think was a great idea. I do like that idea. I did not like the execution, at least in the first half. So that's what our series is about. Section one, as I said, takes way too much of a modernized turn. And then section two is so wildly different than that modernized shit that it feels so out of place. The two things don't connect like this. They feel wildly out of place. The two episodes in specific that I want to talk about um, when I talk about section one is the pilot and the second episode. They were enough to make me almost scrap this entire video. The pilot episode does have more gothical scenery. I will say they show a church, which I really liked. I thought the church was so cool. They show the like, House of Usher, um, old and like dying and stuff like that. I thought it was really cool. Until one of our characters, one of our characters takes a taxi to get to the house. And he's in this gloomy house and the nature is dying and it's the gloomy House of Usher. He takes a Tesla taxi, a bright yellow Tesla taxi to get to the house. So immediately I'm out of the mood. <laughs> Like, why did you have to make it a Tesla? Why, why did you do that? Because, you know, nothing says Poe adaptation like bright yellow Tesla taxi. Just felt really out of place. That is the thing that you're gonna be hearing me say throughout this video, is that it feels out of place. The good settings, the good sceneries, the good scenes aren't as effective and good as they could be because of that one little thing that is so out of place that it just takes you out of the environment completely. If he showed up in just a normal fucking car, I would have been like, cool, but you deliberately made it a yellow Tesla taxi. Why? <laughs> 
I am so out of the mood because now I'm just hyper focused on the fact that he's showing up to this abandoned house that could have been super cool in a yellow fucking Tesla taxi. <laughs> so whatever, that was one of my, you know, grinds with it. Um, and it might sound picky, but that is my, like, that is just a summarized version of my entire problem with honestly this entire series it's that the scenes that could be good aren't really that good because there's so many other things that take you completely completely out of the scene the entire purpose of the pilot is to obviously set up the rest of the show fortunato pharmaceutical is currently on trial for some shady shit. <laughs> and during the trial, the opposing lawyer says, we have an informant, uh, we have an informant, somebody from the family has come to us and told us everything, but we're gonna, we're gonna hide their identity for safety. That's like the reason for the series is that they're trying to figure out who this informant is. After we find this out, they have a dinner at Roderick's house. His beautiful gothic, big mansion. Could have been great. Already, I am disappointed because you're not using your setting to its advantage. And then, and then, and then, <laughs> he hands everyone a contract. It basically says like, if you find out who the informant is, I will pay you. I think it was like some, like 20 or 50 million, something crazy like that. And if you are the informant, you're gonna fucking die. Like some crazy shit. And that could have been such a great, powerful scene. It could have showed us, you know, Roderick being this like powerful thing. Everyone's like kind of scared of him, but they all kind of want the money because we're all money hungry. It could have been great. It could have given us a look into the family. It could have showed us anything. But instead, we reference the everything is cake trend. One of the characters gets handed the contract and he goes, uh, is this cake too? And the rest of the scene is filled with cheesy, easy, cringy dialogue. It is filled with millennial humor. It is filled with like weird flipping off and everyone hates each other. And it's just weird, it's cringy. It doesn't make sense. It takes me so out of the mood because it's just so like, cringy for lack of a better word. And as I said, there's so much potential there. There's so much potential there. That could have been a great spooky scene. If not spooky, it could have definitely helped you out with your setting, but it didn't. Those are my biggest icks with the first episode, I think. Most of the other stuff um, was fine. So yeah, episode one, I watched right at midnight when it dropped and it was enough to turn it off, close it, roll over, and go to bed. <laughs> I had the full intent of watching at least two or three episodes before going to bed that night. I was so disappointed when I watched episode one. I was just like, yeah, no, I'm gonna save this for Morning Mellow because, but then I was like, okay, well, it can't get worse. It got worse. <laughs> episode two was one of the trashiest episodes of a TV series I think I've ever watched. I'm being a little very critical because Mask of the Red Death is one of my favorite Poe stories ever. Ruined it. Ruined it completely for me. We meet the youngest son of the family, Prospero. They named him Perry though. They call him Perry, but his name's Prospero. Immediately, ick, because you're gonna name your character Prospero, but then also have it in a modernized 2023 setting. That doesn't make sense to me. Why did you take a modern take on this in the first place? If you wanted to name him Prospero, then Ugh. So whatever, major ick already is that his name is literally Prospero. Second ick is that their modern day interpretation of the masculine red death and Prospero was a sex addict, drug addict. The entire episode is centered around sex and drugs. I hated it. I hated the modern take on this. There's so many wildly inappropriate and uncomfortable scenes down to <laughs> Prospero is in like a, a thruple of course she is. And they're, they're setting up this masquerade party. She sings WAP. She starts singing WAP. What as- Edgar Allan fucking Poe. 
should never be in the same sentence as WAP. Like, there, if you're making a series about Edgar Allan fucking Poe, there are certain expectations and there are certain things that you have to meet. And not referencing wet ass pussy, that's your biggest one, bitch. <laughs> I, it was enough for me to turn the episode off and like take a lap around my room and then come back. I was so peeved. I was so, I was so uncomfortable. I didn't like it. I didn't like it. This is the biggest reason why I don't think that there needed to be a modern take on Edgar Allan Poe because for me, as a huge Poe fan, I was a, I was a little offended. <laughs> and that pretty much sets a good tune for the entirety of section one. It was shitty and it was trying to appeal to a Wednesday TikTok millennial audience. I didn't like it. I thought it was stupid. It felt rushed. It felt like it was forced. It felt like maybe what ended up happening was when Mike Flanagan was in the process, they told him like, these are certain things that you have to do and you have to reference and you have to make blah, blah, blah. Maybe because it doesn't fit in with any of his other works. I don't understand why you can treat all of your other horror series with fucking respect, but then the Edgar Allan Poe one is the one you mess up. How? <laughs> yeah, I hated it. I don't really think everything needs a modern day interpretation. Edgar Allan Poe will never need a modern day interpretation in this aspect. Now, enough being super critical. Let's talk about section two. I did, I really enjoyed section two. I thought a lot of it was cheesy by all means. I thought a lot of the spooks kind of weren't the best. Um, I thought a lot of the Poe name drops, they, they reference a lot of his poems, which I didn't really like. They just start speaking them to you and you're like, oh, I didn't really like that. They do it with A Dream Within a Dream, The Raven and Annabelle Lee. I hate it. Every single time that they, started speaking the poems, I hated it, not gonna lie. But section two takes a really good setting shift. Everything becomes gloomy and it becomes really good. I really liked section two. If section one could have matched section two, this would have been like my favorite fucking series of all time. But because they're so wildly different, I couldn't even really take the time to really enjoy section two because I just kept remembering where we started and getting kind of peeved, getting a little bit upset and mad. It just feels so out of place. Hi, Gremlin Editor Mello. Something that I thought I said, but I didn't, was that I understand that they were trying to go for like a mirroring the haunted palace, right? The house starts off great and then it falls. You still could have done that with being respectful to the source material, for one, <laughs> and not making it like modernized right because my whole my whole thing is the modernization not the like like you can still make it parallel like the haunted palace kind of thing without making it super like bright and modernized in 2023 and tiktok like you know you still could have made it gothic while still making it like beautiful and bright and radiant and all of that i thought i said that but i wanted to get that out of the way if you've seen any of mike flanagan's previous work uh, section two matches up and it aligns very well with all of his other work. It looks very good alongside of it. There's some great, great spooks. I don't want to spoil it. I don't really think this is a spoiler. Obviously, Fortunato Pharmaceutical, we do end up referencing the Casco Amontillado, which the whole time I was disappointed that they weren't using it, but they were kind of alluding to it and I was like... <laughs> So when they did finally come through and use the cast from Oxyad, I was like, fuck yeah! I really enjoyed that. I thought that part was so fucking cool. I thought the episode with uh, the Telltale Heart, that death was so spooky. It was crazy. I didn't really like that character. I think her name was like Vic or Viv. I didn't really like her character. She pissed me off. But her death sequence was so cool. It was so good. Um, the usage of the Raven. Um, <laughs> it wasn't really my favorite, um, but it was okay. I thought it was really cringy when Roderick was just saying the poem. I didn't really like that. But the visuals that went along with it, I thought were really good. The visuals in the second section were so good. They were everything I wanted them to be. I can't really get over the criticisms that I have in section one are enough to overbear the love that I have for section two. And I'm disappointed. I'm really upset. I really wanted this to be 
an amazing series. And I think section two was really good. I think the meaning, I think the ending was so, I thought, I thought the ending was really good. I really liked the ending, but I couldn't get over where we fucking started. <laughs> Honestly, if you just skip to section two, you're not really missing much. <laughs> Obviously there's like a few little things that you, you should, you gotta know going in, but you're not really missing much. I think the storytelling was very unique. It very much flashed around and there's all kinds of things going on at once. It wasn't my personal favorite, but I didn't not like it at the same time. I thought it was interesting. Um, in section one, they do a lot of like flashback-y scenes that I thought, I thought were really cool. I thought the look into Madeline and Roderick's past. I thought that was really well done. I thought those scenes were really good. Those are my thoughts. Those are my spoiler free thoughts. Go watch the series, honestly. As much as I'm hating on it, I, I really did like the ending. Honestly, just go watch the last episode and you're good. <laughs> Maybe I can make a video dedicated and actually go through episode by episode and kind of spoil it and do a review in that way. Would totally be down if anyone wants to see that from me, but I'm a little disappointed. As Poe fan number one, I'm disappointed. A little bit of spoilers on screen now. Skip to this time for no spoilers. Um, it's not really a huge spoiler, but anyways, hi, welcome spoilers. Not really spoilers. I just, <laughs> I was taking notes um, every episode that I watched. I was watching it on my iPad and I had my phone up and I was just taking notes as I watched. And in the last episode, I'm assuming that you've watched the last episode, so you know, I'm gonna spoil it. But when Lenore dies and when they mention and they reveal that the entire time uh, she's been texting Roderick, it's been the fucking <laughs> Lenore bud spam texting him. Never more, never more, never more. <laughs> I want you to look at my note. I'm gonna put it right here. Me just freaking the fuck out being like, this is fucking stupid. No, no, no. I thought that was so fucking dumb. I, oh my God, that was so stupid. The scene where Lenore dies did make me tear up a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. I did feel a little bit sad. <laughs> I was really good. I think Lenore was the best character since the first episode. She was my favorite character. Um, she does a really, really great job at getting the message and the moral and the theme of the series across. So when she had her unfortunate timing, I I got a little teary-eyed. I'm also just really sensitive. <laughs> Anyways, hi, welcome back. No more spoilers. You didn't miss much. So that's it. That's my thoughts. Thanks for sitting through probably like an hour of me talking um, about Poe. As I've said, I'm literally Poe fan number one, so I'm a little disappointed that this is the conclusion that I came to, but it is what it is. I mentioned it before, but I do have an entire playlist on my channel dedicated to Edgar Allan Poe. This video will be slidden into there, but I do have a little mini series, one where I talk about Poe's history, his poems, and then his short stories. So if this series is making you want to dive into Poe's works, go for it, go watch those videos. I will say one thing, I probably would have enjoyed this series so much more if I wasn't a Poe fan. I think that is the common rhetoric that I'm seeing in reviews, is that the people who are enjoying the series are not Poe fans, um, which makes sense. I'm going to write a proper detailed review over on my bookstagram. I'm gonna put the at in the account on screen now. Um, go follow me there if you are interested in actually like reading a like sit down, detailed, put together um, review from me on this series. I know this is a little bit like all over the place. I'm so sorry. But if the series is your gateway to getting back into Poe um, or getting into him for the first time, we're so happy to have you here. Um, Poe is a great author if you haven't read his stuff. As I said, I have that mini series on my channel that you can go check out and definitely check out his work. I'm gonna go, I'm gonna edit so that I can get this out for you guys as soon as possible. Um, as I said, if you do wanna see me talk about this in a more clean and concise way, let me know. I would be more than happy to, I mean, I'm gonna write that review on my bookstagram. Um, it'll also be linked in the description below. But if you do wanna see like video format of me talking about this in more of like a sit down scripted way, by all means, let me know. I'd be more than happy to actually really dive into all of the episodes, but until then, hopefully I'll see you next week. I don't really have a plan for next weekend's video, so I'm a little worried, but hopefully I'll see you next week. Um, 
you enjoyed, like, subscribe, share, do all those things. It helps me out more than you know, and I appreciate it. Go follow my bookstagram. As I said, I write just reviews for all of like the little books that I don't end up making videos for. I have reviews over there on my account. Um, yeah, so if you want to see more of me, go check out that. If you've watched this far, it means a lot. Thank you if you're new here or if you've been watching me for the last few weeks. It really does mean a lot. I actually have so much fun with this hobby. I haven't had so much fun with a hobby in so long. Um, so it does really mean a lot that people, you know, support me along the way. Anyways, I'm gonna go. Um, I hope to see you back next week, but if I don't, have a great day, have a great life. I never see you again. Um, yeah. Bye. <laughs>